Hello, and welcome to this month's TML Loss Prevention Webinar. The topic this month is going to be excavation and trench safety. My name is Ronnie Sexton, and I'll be the one doing the discussion today. This is an area where within the members of the risk pool, we're still seeing some problems almost every year. We see some people that suffer some injuries. It may be just a severely sprained ankle. It may be a broken leg, twisted knee. Sometimes that even moves on up into the hip area. Sometimes maybe we get into some fractured ribs, dislocated shoulder. And fortunately, I will say that we are doing a lot better as far as fatalities. I hate to jinx the situation by saying that it has been a while. Uh, and I'm hoping it will be a while longer before there's a problem there. And what we're going to talk about today is some general topics and everything. For some of you that's never had any excavation or trench safety, uh, maybe this will be just a little bit of kind of a teaser, which will make you want to go further uh, to try to gain more information about this. If some of you have had some training, it might be a refresher. I might talk about some areas that maybe you didn't get in your training and everything because the thing about it is we should all be open-minded uh, to learning and hopefully everybody will approach this webinar in the manner that they will walk away at the end of it with something that they had forgot about or possibly didn't know about. So what we're really here today is talking about, as I said, this is an area where we're seeing people that's injured out there. And you know, excavation and trench safety, once again, uh, training in this area has been going on for 25 or 30 years because of, a, you know, it got real bad, uh, especially in the late 70s, early 80s. There was a lot of problems there, especially in the industry. But there was a lot of problems with a lot of the municipalities. I know myself coming to work for the risk pool in 96, uh, we have had some fatalities uh, prior to that uh, with some of our members. And we've had several, you know, since uh, that that time period that have occurred. So let's just jump off into this because with excavations and process, you know, this is an area is, yes, I do our confined space. Matter of fact, uh, there was a webinar that will uh, be in February, was in February and everything on confined space. What we're seeing, this is more of a problem because almost everybody is doing some type of excavation. They might not have a lot of confined spaces or they might not have to go down in them, but excavations and our trenches, you're dealing with those. We're going to talk about the de definition of an excavation and a trench, the various soil types and hazards and characteristics of each. We're going to talk about some causes of trench collapse out there. We're going to talk about some association, associated hazards of working in and around an excavation or a trench. We'll talk about some protective systems uh, that can be used out there to protect the workers. And we'll talk a little bit about an organization's policy, the training, and having a checklist out there to be for sure that we've done all the steps that need to be reasonably done to ensure the safety of the workers and also the public out there also. Uh, an excavation. May see the general industry guideline is that is any man-made cut, cavity, or depression to include trenches. And so what you're really looking at there, an excavation is something real large. Uh, you know, it, 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 when you look at it, a trench is at its widest point at the bottom will not exceed more than 15 feet. But you see, see sometimes from foundations or parking garages and some buildings and everything in cities. And where I talk about that is a lot of times, you know, uh, there may be some fire service personnel that's watching this and might have to um, be involved in possibly an excavation or a trench rescue. I know for about a 15 year time period down at A&M, at the municipal fire school in the summer, uh, I was the instructor in charge of the trench rescue project before uh, I was offered a chance to do vehicle operations, which meant rather than being outside for the whole week, I was able to go inside in an air conditioned classroom the last week of July. And it didn't take me a long time to think about that. Uh, but I still do a lot of our training, uh, not only for public works and utilities, um, the parks and recreation, but also for the fire service. Soil type and classifications. And here in the United States, they have broken the soil types down into basically four categories. I'm going to start out first talking about 
stable rock. And there are a lot of areas in Texas that don't have rock. Uh, throughout my time period prior to coming to work here and spending 10 years with two large engineering companies and 10 years with two large utility construction companies as either assistant superintendent, superintendent, or general superintendent, I've done a lot of work in areas where there was solid rock or where there was layers of rock, but then also I've done a lot of work in areas where uh, there's no rock and everything. The problem about the term stable rock it may be until somebody excavates or trenches through it. And, you know, I've used the, the ladder type, the wheel type, the rock saws. Uh, you know, I've used the hoe rams, which is nothing but a jackhammer attached to a backhoe. I've used the rock buckets. I've actually drilled and blasted. And when you excavate through rock, you know, there's a lot of beating and banging and prying and pulling. And, and you know, when you, you get your trench open through there, you have to take into consideration the size of the trench, um, the fracturing that may have took place back into the rock, the natural fractures or planes that there may be in rock. Because you can have, even in rock, you can have layers of different type rocks, and every layer is a potential separation point because there's a little difference in, you know, in the makeup of the rock as far as how hard it is, its density. Um, crumbling factors and a lot of factors in that that you know not going to get that far into the engineering aspect of it. <clears throat> you get into a type A soil and you will hear a term that's used in soil classification especially in the type A, B, and C is a term called unconfined compressive strength and that's based upon if you took one cubic foot of the soil that you're excavating and placed it on a hard surface how much weight can you put on that one square foot of surface area without it compressing? And you're going to see two numbers as the key ones to remember. 1.5 tons per square foot or greater, or excuse me, greater than 1.5 is a type A. But a type A cannot be previously disturbed soil. So if somebody has excavated through there before, it automatically disqualifies it as a type A and brings it down to the next category, which is a type B. To me, when you talk about the unconfined compressive strength, and that's only if you're doing some soil testing we'll talk about here in a minute. A type B is between 0.5 and 1.5. It can be a type A soil that is previously disturbed. Probably the most common soil that most of you are going to have to deal with. It can include soil, it can uh, include soil, and some layers of rock, which you may see in a lot of areas here in Texas. The next area is a type C, and that is your porous classification. It is less than 1.5 tons per square foot of unconfined compressive strength. Um, this is going to be your sand, your real wet soil. Um, the, a lot of times the soil where you've had a water leak that's leaked for a day or two and it's real sloppy or uh, possibly in certain times of year where the ground's real wet. And I jokingly refer to it a lot of times in some of the classes. It's one where as a backhoe operator, you reach out there and you take a bucket of soil out and three buckets run back in, you call that progress. And the problem about that is where you start out a lot of times with a trench that may have been three or four foot wide is because the sides keep caving in or the bottom keeps sloughing off causing the sides to cave in. A lot of times this is where you end up with a trench that's seven or eight, maybe nine or ten foot wide, uh, which a lot of times can be a lot of problems um, because if it caves off and in an area where we talk about is in a lot of cities and everything, you've got a water line that's between a curb and a sidewalk. Well, if it starts caving off there, it can cave off back up underneath a sidewalk where a sidewalk caves in. Or if there's no sidewalk there, it can actually cave off far enough that it crosses that imaginary line in the front yard between city property and private property. And that causes another problem because, you know, there's a little difference than uh, you guys out there walking around and tromping down the grass in my front yard. But when it caves and crosses that, if you look at the legal aspect of it, it falls under a term called the taking of property. 
and you know, in today's lawsuit happy times, some of y'all got some citizens out there that smoke those are, you know, can get a little irate and all that sort of stuff. And that's the ones where I guarantee you, you will fix the grass and the flowers and all that sort of stuff back to their satisfaction. And for any of you that's been doing this very long, you know exactly what I'm talking about there because you've had to deal with all of these. Now, <clears throat> this picture that just popped up there, that is a picture of a pocket penetrometer. And that is one of the two tools that you can use to actually test the soil and everything to determine this unconfined compressive strength. The other picture here is what's called a shear vein or a tor vein. Um, I prefer the pocket penetrometer because it may be a little hard to see the little wheel there, but it has to be that clean every time you get ready to use it. If you're dealing with some a lot of clay content or some real muddy stuff, that starts to become a problem. You know, the pocket penetrometer, it's a lot easier to use. I can clean it off by just wiping it off on a pencil leg or, you know, a little red towel or something that I can't clean it off. The other one's a lot more of a problem. If you're not using that, if you're not testing the soil, then you have to design everything as far as protective systems and approach it as a type C soil, which is your porous classification. Um, so not saying that you do have to test it, but you'll see here in a minute, there's some things as far as options are not allowed in a type C type soil. And so that's where the importance uh, that's used. Causes of a trench collapse. Pressure generated by the surrounding soil. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to give an example that we used in an engineering class that I took several years ago. And we're not going to get into the length of time period that that's been, but it still pertains. And one of the things I have learned about that college professor, as I've got older, I have realized that individual was a lot smarter than what I thought they were at the time. For some of you that's said some of those classes, you know what I'm talking about. You really didn't think it applied that much to you at the time. But he said, when you come along, you dig a trench or an excavation. You've made a cut in the skin of the surface of the earth, and Mother Nature is going to try to heal that wound. It's no different than getting a cut on your arm. What does it naturally try to do? It tries to close up. That's what's going to happen here. So the pressure, and it shows right here. <clears throat> You've got a gravitational pull that's holding everything on earth. Well, when you open that area up to where the little guy there standing and everything, that weight gravitational mashing down transfers to a lateral force that's trying to close these walls. And the longer it stays there and the deeper it gets, and I'm not going to get all into the engineering aspect of it, but this is one of the things right there. And then we turn around and we do what? We take our spoil pile. In other words, the material that we dig out, we pile it right there on the edge of the trench. So let's put a lot of extra weight on one side of the trench. Or we're pulling a dump truck up there because maybe it's some wet, some sloppy stuff and we're hauling it off because we want to try to be able to, we're working in the edge of a roadway or in a roadway and we want to replace it back with some dry material so that we can try to get traffic flowing a lot quicker. Well, look at the weight of the truck and the material that we're putting up there. That's a lot of extra weight that's mashing down, that's creation, creating a greater inward force. So that causes a lot of problems. Just some of the things that we need to be thinking about out there as these are causing potential problems. Excessive vibrations. And probably the example that I use a lot of times, if any of you have ever done much concrete work, where you've had concrete forms and you've put concrete in there and you've put a vibrator in there to vibrate that concrete, if you leave those vibrators in there very long, it will blow the forms. It's just the vibrations will get everything shaking and everything, and all of a sudden things just come apart on you. Well, the same thing happens there. And, you know, if I'm standing out there beside a trench and I can feel a large truck or a bus or something like that go down the road, how am I feeling it? Because those vibrations are coming through the ground. What's that doing to that soil that's creating those little vibrations? It's causing, you know, the molecular structure and all of that to start, you know, to break up and start to come apart. So we have to look at things there. You may have some other construction activities in some of the larger cities. Maybe you've got somebody over there working on a road project where they're doing some pile driving. You know, if you can feel vibrations coming through the ground, that trench is filling them. I guarantee you, and that's causing them problems from some of the heavy equipment and trucks. You know, heavy materials are large spoil piles that we talked about, you know, being placed alongside the, you know, side. Inadequate compaction of soils in close proximity to another trench. 
And you know, this is a lot of times we can see we're digging close to where there's another utility or possibly out in the roadway. We can see a patch in the asphalt or the concrete where you know, maybe something's been put in. Uh, maybe a storm drain's been put in, a gas line, you know, electric line, all the buried things that we see in the ground nowadays that used to, uh, I tell everybody, you know, jokingly, when I first started, there wasn't a lot of stuff in the ground. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a minute. But you know, how close you get, there may only be a foot or so in between the edge of your trench and the edge of that other trench. Uh, and you know, there can be a problem there. A lot of work that some of you do, you go out there and you're doing what I call point repair. You're going out there and you're digging down on top of an existing line to make a tap or make a repair. Okay, you dig down on the old trench until you get down and you find the line. Then you scoot one side to the other and you dig down enough to have enough room to work. Well, on one side there, when you scoot to one side of the pipe, there's a chance you got outside the old trench line. The other side you might not have. How is it compacted back? Because you've got one side that may be undisturbed soil, you've got partially another side that may be previously disturbed soil, it's not as stable. I mean, you can go back and you can take the little wheel rollers that some people put on in place of a backhoe bucket, sometimes the little whacker packers, you know, where you've got somebody going along that's doing the compaction and everything. You will not get the soil compacted back to 100% of original. I know one of the first engineering jobs I did, we were doing an airport runway. Uh, and there, where we were coming in there, we were taking the soil. They were taking, you know, the what I call the great big, you know, tillers coming through there, chewing them up. We were putting lime in there, wetting it, rolling it, and packing. And we were trying to get to 96 to 97 percent of original soil. Uh, so, you know, I know it's not going to happen out here where we're working out here, you know, with the various utilities. Uh, so you've got to take that into consideration. Water at the bottom of the trench, you know, it's starting to bubble up, creating a quicksand, and you'll get what's called a, a, a bell bottom a lot of times. It'll happen there and it'll start to cave out down on the bottom. Well, then you've got nothing supporting the sides, so then the sides come in. And that's a lot of the ones we're using water removal, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. It has to be monitored. Uh, but then also that's the ones where I'm talking about where the backhoe operator, you know, they're digging along once they get to a certain point there and the groundwater starting to come in. <clears throat> they're taking one bucket out and there may be a couple of buckets of material run back in. And this is where, you know, things start to go downhill. And, you know, the excess water can come from rain, melting uh, ice or melting snow. Uh, the ice and snow, you know, you have to look at. We are in Texas. That's not a real big problem in Galveston or South Padre. But you're talking about in the Panhandle area and everything, ice and melting snow can be a problem up there. And you also have to look at the situation there. A lot of times you can get a little bit of a freeze of some of the moisture in the top foot to possibly 18 inches of the soil and everything. And as it starts to thaw out, that's the reason a lot of times a little bit of the lip part of a trench will cave off. Uh, you want to inspect uh, you know, the site uh, daily. Uh, if you've left something open overnight, uh, and you know, or if you have a rainstorm, dramatic weather change event, or after some kind of hazard and increasing event, where I talk about, if you've had a, you know, a side slough off or cave in or some other, then you need to reevaluate because something's going on that's causing a change there. Some of the other association hazards out there that you have to look at that we're going to talk about. Surface encumbrances, and that's anything that's located on top of the ground, close enough to a trench that can be a problem. You know, I talked about a while ago in a lot of the cities, you've got a water line that's located between a sidewalk and a curb. Okay, let's, let's, let's look at those. What part of town are we in? We're in the old part of town. Okay, how long's that curb been there? How long's that sidewalk been there? Got any cracks in it? Where moisture's got in there and eat up the rebar? that was holding those two pieces of concrete together. So now if it caves out from underneath it, is there a possibility that some of that curb or sidewalk could cave off in there? Okay, let's go to the new part of town. Some of the curbs that's being put in now is a dry slip form concrete. In other words, they bring a dry concrete mixture out there, the cement truck dumps it off into a hopper that vibrates it and puts it in the shape of a, a <coughs> curb, They'll go along down through there about every 16 or 20 feet. There's a little blade comes down and inserts a little piece of felt board inside of there as an expansion joint. A lot of those have no rebar inside of there. 
And so in other words, you've got some just by some concrete that's sitting up there on top of the ground where if something happens there and it caves out from underneath it, you've got the possibility of, you know, of that. Okay, let's go over to the sidewalk. A lot of the sidewalk that's poured nowadays, maybe they have some wire mesh in there. But I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about a city and I'm not going to name it that's close to the Austin area. Several years ago, I was driving through a new subdivision out there. And like I said, my background in con utility construction and engineering and having inspected a lot of jobs, I seen that they were pouring a sidewalk. And I noticed this guy that was holding the end of some of this about four inch uh, you know, wire mesh and everything. And he's taking this piece of mesh and he's dragging it in between the farms as they're pouring concrete. Now I know exactly what he's doing. He's looking around for an inspector. As long as there's no inspector, they're not putting that wire in there. So, you know, you think there's something in there, there wasn't. The only way that they were going to put any wire meshes in there is if an inspector come driving up or something other, then they would start putting that in there. Now, you have some unscrupulous contractors that will do something like that, and you may have some of that in your area. So don't take it for granted that if it caves out underneath that sidewalk, that concrete's going to stay there because you might end up with some of that in there. And that's going to cause possibly some strained sprains or some broken bones if something like that happens. And if you're bent over, that could change things a good bit because you don't do all the work in a trench standing up. Uh, matter of fact, there may be some times where you may be on your hands and knees trying to clean out underneath a pipe to get a tapping saddle or a repair clamp on there. And if something happens there, you're going to end up with some of that on top of your head or your back. So you have to look at a lot of these hazards. Don't look at it that you're going to be doing all the work standing up. It's only going to affect, you know, from the waist down. You don't do all your work standing up. Underground installations, and this is one I want to talk about. And if you'll look there in the upper right-hand corner there is a little <clears throat> American Public Works Association where they agreed upon these various colors and everything. And, you know, the underground installations, we're supposed to have them located. You're supposed to have the dig ticket. You know, if there is a major problem and you have to do an emergency dig, you're still supposed to locate them. You're to tell them it's an emergency dig. But if you're going to have them come out and locate the white, that's where we go out there and we do what's called white line, the location where we're going to be digging. So when the people come out there to do the locates, they can look and see, say, okay, you're digging over on the right-hand side of the road. We don't have anything. There's nothing over there. So it saves them a lot of problem and everything. The next area there is pink, and that was the color that they agreed upon, you know, for uh, surveying markers. But let me tell you what I have found over my years. And I started with a survey and engineering company right after, you know, um, I graduated. Is you know, I started with a survey and engineering company on Monday morning, and I started college Monday night. Uh, wasn't a little bit of a challenge there. But what I found about the color of paint that they use for marking is usually tied back to the colors of the university that the individual that owns the company graduated from. Is yes, I have seen maroon out there, I've seen orange, and I've seen green, and we're not going to go into all the others. Is you know, I haven't seen black, but you know, if the Red Raiders want to go out there and use red, then I don't know whether that's a survey and marker or it's a power line, so they need to be pretty careful if they're going to do anything there. And I know there is a few Red Raider uh, graduates that's some public works and utility directors out there, so they might not see a lot of humor in this. The next one there, as we discussed, is red, is electric. What you have to realize is this is where a lot of times dealing with your local utilities, talk to them. Well, there's a problem there, is what has happened over the years is, you know, I can remember it started out, it was TU Electric, where I grew up. Well, they've been bought out. You've got Atmos, you know, which does gas, but they have some. Uh, you, you've got all these different energy people that have bought out. But if you go back and look, basically you have two types of power. Usually it's 600 volts and less and greater than 600. Your less than 600 is going to usually be like 120 volts going off over here to a straight light or, you know, just, just some things like that. It could be 240. You might even see some 480. How deep is it buried? At a certain depth, if they can't get any deeper than that, um, they may put it in a gray plastic conduit. If it gets shallower than that, they may put it in a metal conduit. Um, or if it's in rock, a lot of times it's supposed to, uh, they may cap it off with some red concrete. Um, if it's buried, it's supposed to have one foot above the line, it's supposed to have the red tape. But you know, I've seen contractors out there burying power lines that run out of tape. 
I've seen them throwing it in there where actually the power line is laying on top of the tape. So, you know, these are general specifications, but unless somebody's sitting there watching every inch of the job, you really don't know what you got. And then also the other thing that I put into consideration, what has happened to the ground since the power line was buried? Have they come in and have they taken off some ground, you know, to try to smooth some things out, or have they filled in? And then your next is going to be greater than <clears throat> 600 volts, that's where you're going to see a lot of your distribution. Uh, maybe 7,200 volts, you may see 14.4 in some of the buried. You can even see some higher voltages sometimes, uh, but red. The next you get into yellow. Yellow is gas. Most of the time, general rule of thumb in Texas, gas lines are buried about 24 inches. Now, let's go back and let's look at gas, okay? Some of the cities out there still have some old gas lines that are steel that's still functional. When you look, when the poly gas lines first started and everything in Texas, they were orange. Orange now is communications. So you may see an orange pipe that might not be communications, and I don't know, could still possibly be used. Then they come up with yellow pipe. Now they've been experimenting with some black pipe that has some yellow, uh, yellow spiral stripes that go around it and everything. So, you know, when you start digging out their gas line, what are you looking for? The gas, the metal gas line, is it still working or not? Because, you know, and if somebody's not real good about locating, and I had this happen in a city where, you know, I was over the utilities and everything, they located the metal, but they didn't locate the poly. And we cut the poly when we were digging down, you know, to fix a water line and everything that created some problems. And that's where I learned the difference between a low pressure system and a high pressure system, which we don't have time to go off in that area today. Uh, but uh, it can create a lot of problems. Your next area there is orange. That's going to be your telecommunications and data. That's going to be, you know, telephone. Okay, on public right of way, telephone is supposed to be, supposed to be buried 24 inches. Cable TV. I've always jokingly said if you can mow the grass and not cut the cable TV ca uh, cable, they considered it buried deep enough. And some of you, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about there. Now, fiber optics, let's talk about that. You're going to have two types of fiber optics. You're going to have local. And you know, nowadays, you know, that, that may be cable TV is being done over fiber, phones being done over fiber. Uh, but then when you get in your cross country, Fiber optics. I will tell you this here. If you cut one of those, you're going to meet some new people because there's going to be some people that you're going to think fell out of the sky with no clouds or trees around. What I have found, though, when you have a lot of people show up around the trench out there that's wearing a suit and tie, they're not there to help you. But some of you just cut one of those. Now, most of the time, they're on private easements and where they do cross, cross a public roadway, such as a city street or something like that, they are encased in a steel conduit because those are very high dollar because of the, the amount of data and everything is being transmitted over those. So they are pretty well protected and everything. But, you know, let's, let's talk about why this is important. I cut a telephone cable. And unfortunately, every, you know, not everybody has a cell phone. And if I cut that telephone cable, somebody might not be able to call 911 because they need the police department, they need the fire department, they need EMS. So now are we looking at a potential liability issue? And in today's world where everybody wants to sue, who knows? It might be something that you might get out of, but somebody's going to spend a lot of time looking to see if you can get out of this. Uh, and so we, we just got to do a whole lot more now, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do to show that we did what another reasonable and prudent person would have done. And that's being for sure that we get all this located and we'll pr pr uh, proceed in a reasonable manner. Uh, your next area there is blue. Now notice that is a dark blue. There's actually a light blue that just really, it was the color that's held. It's not being used, but the blue is where you should be locating uh, your potable water lines and everything. You get into the purple. Uh, the purple there is beneficial reuse, and we're seeing more and more cities are getting into to where they're taking the discharge water from a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it's being used for a lot of irrigation of uh, golf courses, baseball fields, soccer fields, football fields. It's being used in some commercial applications and everything um, in industry. 
uh, where they're used in the first place I ever ran into it was it happened to be down in Harlingen where they not too far from where that the particular treatment plant was where the water was coming from was a fruit of the loom and they was using that water for their dye water to dye their underwear and t-shirts uh, which made for some very interesting water coming back into the plant of all the different colors and everything. First time I ever seen a sedimentation basin that looked like a peacock with the different colors of water in there, but it was very interesting. Um, but you're seeing more and more of that. Uh, not, <coughs> not only is the marking supposed to be purple, the pipe is supposed to be purple to designate it. When they first started, they started out with a white pipe with just purple lettering, but if you turn the pipe and the letterings down, then you really didn't know what type of pipe it was. So that's the reason they've gone to now. It's supposed to be a, pie, uh, a, a purple. It won't be quite as dark as what's designated there. And then green, that's for sanitary sewer. Uh, notice one that's not there, storm drain. Uh, they didn't pick a color for storm drain. Uh, so if you have to locate that, uh, I really can't tell you what color to use there. Uh, because if you use the sewer, uh, you know, that's, you know, I, I, I really can't tell you. Uh, you know, that's one where you're probably just going to have to reach some kind of consensus and you talk with the local people and tell them, look, we've got a storm drain out here. Uh, <clears throat> next area you get into is access and egress. The standards say that on any trench four foot or deeper, a ladder, stairways, or ramp is to be provided as a way for people to get in and out. And if you're using a ladder, the ladder is to extend three foot above the side of the trench, which gives a person something to hold on to while getting on or off the ladder. And this ladder or means of egress is to be placed where the worker does not have to travel more than 25 feet one way or another horizontally to reach a way of getting out from there. Now, personally, I like the ladder, and I like the ladder close enough that Ronnie can touch it. Because if something goes wrong, and it comes time for Ronnie to leave, Ronnie wants to be going upwards, not going right or left. Because I realize every ladder rung is one foot less of Ronnie that gets covered up. So keep that in mind. Now, a little precaution about the ladders. Sometimes fire departments get real generous, and they will approach utility department or parks and recreation about giving them a ladder you might want to ask a question. Why is the fire department getting rid of it? Being fire service certified, I can tell you, it wouldn't pass their annual ladder certification test. So sometimes, contrary to what my grandfather said, maybe you do need to look a gift horse in the mouth. So be a little careful about that. Exposure to vehicular traffic. We actually had a fatality that occurred, I want to say about two years ago. Uh, it's just a simple, you know, they're going out, they're basically, um, there's a service, <clears throat> water service that needed to be repaired. Individual comes along and strikes a worker. Uh, it kind of changed my mind about some things because basically, you know, they were digging out from the meter out into the street. And looking back to the right there, yes, they had a sign down there. They had cones out. They had a truck angled. You know, the workers were out there in vests. This individual come from the left. 30-mile-an-hour residential street person was not impaired, not on any kind of drugs or alcohol or anything like that there, comes through, runs underneath basically the boom of a little mini excavator from what I was told, comes across the trench striking the worker that's in the trench, knocking him out from there, which meant he completely run over him. Hit the corner of the truck that was parked there, kind of bounced off it, struck a mailbox, and kept on going. And finally PD finds him, you know, 10 or 12 blocks away and everything. It's like, I didn't know I hit anything. And so, you know, this is what we're looking at out there. So, you know, folks, we need to be sure we got our signs out. I don't care if you got two cones, get them out. Place your vehicle as a physical barrier. Now, remember this here. If it's an automatic transmission, angle the vehicle and set your parking brake because there's not much holds you there when it's, you know, you just put an automatic transmission in park, uh, a person come along, strike that vehicle, they shear that pin off. Now you're underneath the vehicle that you'd placed as your physical barrier. So put it at a little bit of an angle. Turn the wheels don't do any good. Wheels that are turned are only functional when they start rolling. Otherwise, some hit them, it's just going to slide forward. So angle the vehicle. As long as you're inside of a protected work zone and you've got it identified and everything, because we've got to try all that. Wear your traffic vest. There's too many standards out there that says that, but let me tell you, here's the standard that I have. 
I'm not going to guarantee that that traffic vest will save your life. But I will guarantee if you're not wearing it, you're not giving it a chance to. So give your traffic vest the chance to do its job. And some cities need to realize maybe you need to issue more than one per career. Because some of the ones, after so many washings and everything, you honestly can't tell what color it is. I want it. Now, I have people say, you know, hey, that traffic vest makes me a target. If you're a target, it means one thing. You're visible. Doesn't mean you're not going to get run over, but at least you're visible. And, you know, it, it, it's just it's the smart thing to do. Exposure to falling loads. And, you know, we've heard all of our life for people that's worked around construction don't get underneath a suspended load. And, you know, we see loads being picked up with some of the nylon pipe slings and everything that once upon a time might have been good enough to hold it. But how many times have you used it jerking a truck out of a ditch that was struck? Uh, how faded is it? How much hydraulic oil has it's been on it? Does it look kind of like a yellow and white Dalmatian and everything from the HTH that's been spilt on it? You know, all these things start to deteriorate that. And, you know, this, you know, or, or, you know sometimes a chain. Maybe the chain might have been proper until, you know, once again, you've pulled on it too much. Now you've got a 16-foot chain that's 18 foot long. Uh, you know, some of the links, you know, they're froze up where you've got a two or three foot section there that you can't bend it because they've been stretched and locked up. I don't want to get underneath a load like that. And then also, what happens if, you know, that frayed hydraulic line that you hadn't got changed out, what happens if now it decides to come, you know, blow? You've got a problem there. Mobile equipment. A lot of times we're out there around mobile equipment. And sometimes maybe just the mobile equipment is. And what I really like is, you know, that person that's standing at the end of the trench that's giving the backhoe operator instructions, you know, that's doing something other, you know, like this here. You know, sometimes you wonder whether or not they're having a seizure. And then sometimes you just have to stop and tell them, my backhoe bucket just won't do that. And what I really like is when you get two people out there, one of them's wanting you to go up, one of them's wanting you to go down, or one's wanting to go left or right. Sometimes you just have to stop. But mobile equipment, we've seen people that's been run over and killed by mobile equipment with backup alarms working. And so we have to look at these things. And like a lot of times, if you're operating close to a trench, you, maybe you need a spotter. If you really can't see and you're getting up there too close to keep the side of a trench, especially if you still got somebody in there. And where this happens a lot of times is when you're doing water or sewer line and you're dumping a little bit of bed and sand in there to try to make a good smooth cushion for it to set on and everything, you need to step back out of the potential collapse zone, but be sure you still stay within a safe zone while they dump that and everything. Because once again, what? I've got a excess load coming up on the side of a trench. Uh, hazardous atmospheres. <clears throat> Sometimes this can be caused, especially like maybe where they fill in some ground. There's some vegetation and everything there, and it's decomposing. You may be, uh, maybe you've got a collapsed sewer line. You're working on it. Gas lines. Uh, now, if you're digging close to a gas line and it starts leaking, everybody, well, I'll smell it. Well, you have to go back and look. One of the major violations that gas systems get written up on in the state of Texas is you know, inadequate amount of odorant. And what that means is they didn't put enough mercaptan in there, and you're not going to be able to smell it, and especially the time it comes through some of that soil. That soil may absorb some of that, so you may not. So if you're working there, you need to be doing some testing. Now, let's talk about another, one of the more common hazardous atmospheres in a trench. How many of y'all have ever cut a piece of pipe with a gasoline-powered cutoff saw? Let's think about it. You're down in a trench doing what? Running a gasoline-powered motor. You're sitting there <laughs> coughing and gagging. And you're probably making a comment, this stuff can kill me. Well, yeah, it can. But let's talk about what type of pipe are you cutting? AC pipe? Plastic pipe? Ductile? Steel? Cast? There's some stuff that's coming off that you don't need to be breathing. Now, listen close. The little cotton dust mask is not approved for asbestos, but it's a lot more than what some of you are wearing right now. So think about that. What about taking a bottle of water and pouring a little water on that pipe that cuts down on the dust? Now, I'm not saying drown the blade, but we actually help lubricate it a little bit better. So, you know, there's some simple practical things that you're not going to find in a lot of books and everything that's simple. But like I said, that white cotton dust mask, as I said, it is not approved 
for asbestos, but it's a lot more than what some of you are wearing, which is what? Nothing. Uh, so you have to look at those. Where's the water pump? Which way is the exhaust coming? You know, there's just a lot of things that you have to think about potential hazardous atmospheres. We're creating the problems. Hazards from water accumulation. Uh, it's kind of interesting. When you look at a lot of the accidents that occur out there, we don't see a lot of the ones where you see the what I call the old wet, sloppy ground, the leaking water leak, because you know where the stuff is just running in. Because we know those are hazards. Our awareness level goes up. And so, but you don't ever drop your guard on that. Employee protection. We want to protect the employee that's working down in the trench from stuff falling off the side or rolling off down in there. And one of the ways you do that is have a two foot wide clear area all the way around. Keep stuff from rolling in there, but it also prevents trip hazard from somebody that's walking around tripping that can possibly fall off in there. Inspections. We want to continue to be inspecting the work site and the trench area and everything anytime anybody's working around or especially when somebody's in there. It's not a once a day and then somebody goes on, you leave the workers out there. No, somebody has to be out there the whole time that's watching out for this. And this is where training is important. The more people out there that's trained, the more eyes that's looking because you're looking one way, I'm looking another way. If it's here in the middle, we're going to be seeing things different. So you might pick up on something that I can't see because it's over on the other side. More sets of eyes, the safer we're going to be. Now, your protective system options include sloping, which includes benching, shoring, which may be timber, hydraulic, pneumatic, or mechanical. We're going to talk about these each one a little bit more. Shielding, commonly done with the trench boxes or the man guards. Now, <clears throat> the chart talks about you know, as far as sloping, it gives you some slope angles. Talks about you on know, stable rocks, straight up and down 90 degrees. Remember, what I was talking about earlier, when you dig through there, look what's happening to the sides. So you can get a lot of crumbling and pieces falling off. Type A, a three quarter to one, or works out to a 53 degree angle. Type B is, is a one to one, or 45 degree angle. And a type C, a one and a half to one, or a 34 degree. Uh, and where these start to play in is you know, the width every once in a while. But let me tell you a general rule of thumb. Look at the spoil pile. When you take this material out and you pile it up, it's going to seek an angle. Look at that angle. It's called a, you know, an angle of repose or it's an angle of stability. Mother Nature is pretty sharp. Look at that and look at the side of the trench. And if they are not close, especially if you're the one that's going to be going in the trench, you'll have to have a little conversation with somebody and say, no, 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 no. You know, Ronnie said that ain't right. So put it back on me. I don't have a problem about that. Now, simple sloping. Now, this is kind of an interesting picture here. You know, they've got the ladder as a way of getting down in there and everything. And then you walk up, you know, towards the top of the picture there. They've got some shoring down there. But in progress and from where the ladder is to up there, you go from a safe area through an unsafe area to get to another safe area. Be careful about that because you're putting yourself in an area of exposure there in a little brief area that's unsafe. Now, when you look at the slope and you've got your type A, which is three quarter to one. So in other words, <clears throat> for every foot in depth, you have to go over nine inches. Uh, the next one there is a type B, which is a one for one, uh, one to one ratio. And basically what happens there, for every foot in depth the trench is, then I have to go a foot, you know, each side of the trench. So notice what's happening to the trench. It's really starting to open up. Now, if you're not going to do any testing, and you have to go to a type C, we're talking about a one and a half to one, or look what happens here. And let's just take a six foot deep trench. Well, let's say it's four foot wide at the bottom, because you dig down on top of the pipe, most of you digging with about a 24 inch bucket, so when you scoot over to the side, you're going to end up about a three and a half, four foot wide trench. So let's keep math simple and go at four foot. Okay, I'm six foot deep, so now I need to go nine foot this way, and I need to go nine foot over that way, which that is a total of what? 18 feet plus the four feet, that's 22 feet. Where do you have that much room? You're not gonna dig up that much out in the middle of the street. You may not have that much room in front of my house. You're not gonna have that much room in a utility easement. You're not gonna have that much room in an alley. So what I'm saying right here is sloping is not a very viable safety means for a lot of you to use. Now, this is what I'm going to say. It's not in the book, and I understand the real world. I understand some of you go out there and you're going to slope. If you can get a little slope, 
You might not be able to get what's being showed up here on the screen, but a little slope increases the chance of the sides doing what? Sliding downwards rather than doing what? Coming in like this here. Where would you rather have it? Down around your ankles and knees or up here? Now, I don't recommend that, but I'm saying if that's a last case option, if you can get a little slope, at least what you're doing is you're stacking the deck a little bit in your favor. That is last resort. And I hope everybody remembers, last resort. If you have no other option, last resort. Get into benching. It talks about in type A. And if you'll notice, look at benching, the first bench level up. If you look at the dotted line there on the right, that is the angle that it would be as slope. Now, it's a lot easier to dig with a bucket unless you've got one of the fancy ones that does this here, is to be able to do the benching configuration. The type B, once again, notice the dotted line there on the right. First bench level coming up being double width where everything behind, above that is outside, not approved in type C soil. So if you're not typing the soil, you can't bench. And if you're telling me that you're benching, and you're not testing the soil, then you're telling me that you don't understand what you can do and what you can't do. And you get into your short timber. Timber's pretty well gone the way of the dinosaur. Uh, it's very expensive. It's hard to find a lot of the size timbers that's used there. You start with six by six solid oaks, and you can get up to 12 by 12s. A lot of problems there. Also, the other problem is very hard to dig two trenches identical. So if you use it here, there's a good chance you may not be able to use it unless it's narrow. Uh, so it's very wasteful. Hydraulic. Been around about 35, 40 years. It's probably the best. One of the reasons I like it, I can install it and remove it, stand it on top of the trench, which is the safest place to be. Uh, but it's, I'm going to say this right here. I've dealt with it, uh, you know, in watching contractors use it with the engineering aspect, I've used it for contractors, I've used it in rescue, I've used it working for a city. Uh, I'm going to say just a ballpark figure, probably about 90 to 95% of the time it can be used. What I will say is this right here, the more time you use it, the more it goes up here in the database of options that you have. So it's one of those things, it's an ongoing learning, and you'll, will it work? Is it safe? That's kind of the general guidelines that I used to always, you know, pretty well stipulate and everything. Will it work? Is it safe? Then you get into the pneumatic. Pneumatic's very popular in the fire service and everything. The only thing that I don't like, you cannot leave them on air. You have to convert them to a mechanical means because air is compressible. So if the soil starts moving and comes in, it could compress enough that it could blow the seals and cause a catastrophic failure of the system. The problem that I've had and use them in doing rescue training is sometimes after you get through with your training evolution, the air pressure is not great enough to move it out enough to release the mechanical. So sometimes you see some damage from those. Uh, but like I said, it's pretty well used just strictly in the fire service. Mechanical, the old screw jacks, <clears throat> once again, kind of like the timber, has pretty well gone the way of the dinosaur. Uh, the real problem with those was just human nature. We put them in there and we tighten, we spend the little deals, you know, to kind of put them up against the sides of the trench. And a lot of times, you know, you had to have something, and these were being used in the day of the old timber. Uh, so you had, you know, a timber, like a lot of times, a, a two by 12 oak on each side. And you get it up there and you get it tight. We figure if tight's good, tighter would be better. So we take and we put a cheetah pipe on there and we really romp down on it. Or if we don't have a cheetah pipe, we're taking a hammer and we're beating on it. What you can do, those are tempered threads on there. And what you can do is you can crack those threads. Or you can crack that collar, causing a catastrophic failure of that. The other thing about it is, is a lot of times over on the left-hand side, that was a longer piece of pipe and it just slipped up inside of there, and when handing it to somebody down in a trench, a lot of times one end would you know, slip off and resulted in you know, some injuries of somebody being struck by just part of that. Uh, they're not approved for uh, greater than five foot spans either. So you know, uh, that's the problem there. <clears throat> trench shield, 
uh, the shield, trench box, man guards, uh, the big trench box that's showed here. They're not practical with a lot of our cities because something that size right there, first of all, having the room to use it, having that's going to require a track type machine to be able to handle it. Those are going to be too big for your rubber tired um, backhoes to be able to handle. Uh, they can be stacked. They can actually be hooked end to end, uh, <clears throat> you know, where you can have for a greater length if you need it and everything. Uh, very good, but the only place you're really going to see those in some of the larger cities, or you may see them being used on some of your construction projects that some contractor might be doing for you. <clears throat> there in the lower left-hand corner is an aluminum panel shield. Uh, they're light enough that some of your larger rubber-tired machines will handle on them. And one of the things I do like about them is they do have the little inserts that will slide in on the ends, which protects a little bit of the end of the trench from caving in and causing a problem. <clears throat> Over on the upper right there is the old man guard, which really all that is is a piece of eight foot diameter culvert pipe uh, that they welded some rings on, put some legs on it, and they just stood it up like this. And what it was originally designed for was to slip over a sewer manhole so that when you were tying it in, the people were in there grouting or concreting in the pipes and everything, it allowed them, a, it was a tight area to work, but it gave them a safe area to work. <clears throat> the problem about those is this right here. It's sort of like this cup right here. This styrofoam cup is fairly strong as long as pressure is put it around it equally. But what happens when you put it in a trench and it kind of does like this right here and starts to deform or become egg shade or elongate and everything, it collapses. So to solve that problem, they come up with, you know, some tap boxes or, or and you'll notice this one here has three panels that you can open up. Some have four. But, you know, they either come in a square or a rectangular configuration where it's a lot easier to put in a trench and is still structurally strong and everything. <clears throat> and when you get into the, the tap boxes and everything, they can be handled by your larger down to your mid-side. It would put a strain on some of the smaller rubber tire machines. But as long as you're not trying to reach too far, either swinging it or setting it and everything, that would work. But this would be an area where you don't want to work it in a trench while you're uh, swinging that suspended load around over it. Some other things to help, and once again, if you can con contact us, uh, my email address is rsexton at tmlirp.org, or you can contact you know, TML, look at loss prevention, or your loss prevention rep. Um, and we can get you a copy of these uh, checklists and everything. It's very useful. Uh, you need to have a policy in place, and it needs to be followed. I know in the supervisor program I talk about there, if you've got policies and procedures, they're either going to protect your people or you're going to give them to the other side to use against you because you didn't believe in following your own policies. So that's the importance there. I don't believe in writing policies so strict uh, that you don't allow a little bit of flexibility or common sense to play in there, but policy and procedures are really guidance for people to use and follow. You need to train your super, uh, supervisor and employee training to make sure that they understand what kind of hazards, what they're dealing with, the importance of you know filling you know this checklist out right here. Uh, it can assist personnel to ensure the necessary safety precautions been addressed and in place. And also on the back side of this right here is kind of a damage assessment in case you have damaged something you know, where you can do some documentation um, because this really fits in with our claims department. <clears throat> in case you've damaged something else, you know, they're going to ask for, you know, did you have something like this here? What did you do? And, you know, there's room on the back side, you know, for, you know, when did you notify? Who did you damage? Did you take some pictures? Was it properly located? And folks, let me tell you something about pictures and excavations. <clears throat> With the price of digital cameras, and we're not talking about we need 35 millimeter quality pictures. I don't know why every crew that's going out to doing excavations doesn't have a digital camera. Take some pictures, uh, you know, they can be downloaded, they can be stored. I'm going to tell you, if something's going to come about because you've damaged your utility, it's going to happen within 90 to 120 days. Um, save it that long. Save your pictures. You know, pictures, 
you know, can go a long ways in shoring. But you want to take pictures before you start. Uh, a lot of times, maybe taking a shovel handle or taking a tape measure, measuring how far off of a curb there is to a paint mark that maybe you're going to dig up because it's on some asphalt or maybe it's on some grass or something other. Something's not going to move where you can show that a line was mislocated. And to me, that is one of the things that I think was probably the best about some of the changes in the excavation rules. All this, you know, uh, <clears throat> the dig permit form and all that sort of stuff, is if you can show that the people that located the land mislocated it, you can put some of that liability back on them and having to pay for the cost of the damage and everything as long as you proceeded in a reasonable manner. And with the cost of repairing some of these lines and everything, this can become very important. And what I tell a lot of times, if you can get out of one damage, that's gonna pay for a bunch of cameras and everything. So it's something that people really need to think about. Loss prevention services, uh, we've got the online learning where there's some training there where you can take. And to me, where the online learning, and especially with electronic media down there, it's very important with new hires in their orientation. Or nowadays, the proper terminology is onboarding because uh, we're bringing them on board. But this is when we fail a lot of our new employees. We're too busy or too interested in trying to get them out there too fast, and we're putting them out there half prepared. Let's slow it down a little bit. Take advantage of some of this right here. It's not going to cost you anything. Set them down at a computer. It may help them learn, but it may also help me. You know, how'd they do on the test? Did they did they take the learning serious? Or did they take it as a joke? That's telling me a whole lot, you know, as a supervisor, so I'm how I'm going to have to deal with this person. And the dealing may be with, you know, we decided we really don't need you. And we can do it real quick. Or Maybe we find out somebody's got a little bit of a learning difficulty. Doesn't mean I don't want them. It just means that I'm going to have to deal with that person a little bit different than some of the others. So take advantage of these. They're no cost. Well, I like to rephrase that sometimes. It's part of the services that you've paid for. So it's some that you've paid for that you're not using. So why not use the services that we have available to you? You know, we've got the online learning. We've got the electronic media library. You can go online, look at the, you know, gives you a little short descriptions. You can check them out online. The training programs, we've got some three-hour excavation and trench safety programs. We actually do have some longer where we get into some hands-on training where we use your equipment. There's no need in, you know, uh, when I first went to work here, we bought a trailer and had a whole lot of equipment and everything on it. But you know what I realized? At 5 o'clock in the afternoon when I shut the door on that trailer and locked up and pulled out of town, what do you have to work with? And so it's better for us to train you on your equipment and maybe suggest some of the things that you can do to better protect yourself. So these are loss prevention services that you have. Take advantage of because you never know. One of those right there could be the difference in an employee going home. Until next time, y'all be careful out there. Thank you.